students in real time? How do we help students learn within that? What stories do they have to share? And are there... We need to understand, they can't get food. Or they, they need to foster a healthy disregard for the impossible. I am really excited to share with you this morning. When I was 15, I spent a lot of time in my room alone. I used to film myself uh, in my room doing what most kids do, writing songs about cats and <laughs> filming my opinions on things and uh, just being incredibly, incredibly awful. I was uh, writing songs that nobody would hear, making movies that nobody saw, because thank goodness YouTube did not exist yet. <laughs> but there was one day when I was in my room, and I came to this idea that what if I stepped outside and I tried to do something? And, and I realized that I, want, I have it in me to do something important, but, but I don't know what. So I decided to find the first need that I had, and that was that my school was boring. I grew up in a really small town. My school had nothing to do. So I said, I'm going to set out to make my school awesome. I'm going to create the very first, I was thinking, you know, college is fun. So I'm going to create the very first fraternity at my high school. My school needs a Greek system. So I set out to make the very first fraternity at my high school. But then I realized that fraternity means just dudes. So I set out to invite girls. Um, and so I made the very first fraternity slash sorority, or um, a Ferrari. And at my school, we had this giant Ferrari, and uh, we had shirts printed up that said Brad Kappa Chad, because if you're going to do something, name it after yourself. <laughs> Write that down. Just kidding. <laughs> I wrote Brad Kappa Chad on the shirts. People were buying these shirts, and it was incredible to see my name on people's shirts. They're wearing them. I was like, I'm awesome. This is going great. We had a big meeting, and, uh, and I told everybody, okay, we're selling these shirts. And everybody's like, yeah. And I was like, at the end of the year, we're going to have a big party. And everybody's like, yeah. And I was like, our mascot's going to be a pig, because I grew up on a farm, and pigs are readily accessible. So everybody's like, yeah, our mascot's a pig. And I was like, at the end of the year at the party, we're going to eat the pig. Yeah. It, it, nothing. Uh, There's no sound except for the tears of a few girls. And uh, so I quickly was like, just kidding. Cancel barbecue. Okay, like, this is a bad idea. But somehow this was still working. People were buying the shirts. Things were happening. It was really exciting. People were talking about this thing that was happening. They didn't even know what it was. And I was like, this is great. But I was struck with an idea. What if I could sell more shirts? So I made a little sign that said, proceeds go to sick kid. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I like to think that there was this part of me that was like going to find a kid and, and heal him. Um, but it was, you know, intentionally vague enough, just charitable enough in which nobody would say, hey, how many proceeds? What's exactly the percentage? And who's the sick kid? Nobody was going to ask these questions, right? Except for my mom. <laughs> He's like, this is really great what you're doing, Bradley, but um, who's the sick kid? Who do you know that's sick? How did you set up a separate bank account? These are questions I didn't want to answer because I didn't have an answer. It was after a trip to a St. Jude Research Hospital. My mom took me. And there I came face to face with kids my age who were battling illness. And there I came face to face with kids my age who it could just as easily have been myself. I came face to face with my own selfishness and my own ignorance. And suddenly sick kid had a face. Sick kid had a name. And I had a new mission. Is in that I was struck with an idea, what if you could combine compassion 
acts of compassion with creativity? What if I could take all of those things that I was doing, these, making these weird videos and writing songs and somehow making something good happen? But I didn't quite know what that looked like. But I knew that if you could do compassion pl plus creativity, something could happen. Something awesome. So I became, I rewinded, and set out on a mission and on a quest, a quest to find awesome. Now awesome is a word we use a lot. We throw this word around a lot. We use the word awesome to, de to s define things like sunsets or to describe things like Justin Bieber <laughs> or to say, yeah, okay, never mind. <laughs> we use awesome to describe things like TED Talks, my TED Talk. That's right. <laughs> but if you, we were thinking, okay, if you could take creativity, partner with compassion, that would be the formula for awesome. So my friend Jonathan and I, years later, it was with that heart that we set out to start something. We found ourselves surrounded with incredibly creative people, designers, filmmakers, writers, musicians, these people who were beautifully amazing at creating beautiful art. And so we created something called Love and Stereo. Love and Stereo crea does creative projects for good. We, we said, let's take these people and connect them to great causes all over the world. There are needs in all over the world. What if we could use creativity and match it with compassion? So for our first few projects, we set out and we, had, we designed some t-shirts and created some merchandise that was sold um, at events and on our website. Uh, for our friend in Haiti. All the proceeds went actually went directly to an orphanage uh, in Haiti where our friend works. We created an album that was also sold, and these were songs that went um, directly to Haiti. We partnered with um, several designers and created some projects that happened to help homeless teenagers in Portland, Oregon. We then uh, when, the, when Nashville was ravaged by the flood, there were several homeless men and women who were displaced. So we had a designer who created a shirt that was sold in a poster print, um, all of which went directly to help create um, homes and places for homeless. But one of the things that we were struck with is that as we set out on this journey to partner creativity with compassion, is that usually when somebody set out to uh, do a promotional campaign or to uh, ask for money, there's always a lot of sadness. And so we, we wanted to approach this very differently, to do this in fun, because our goal was to amplify good. We wanted to, to actually bring out the joy in giving and changing things. And so just an example of how we set out to do this a little differently, um, we did a project recently called Socktober. Um, now Socktober was a viral campaign that we set up in which uh, via several videos and things online, I stated, that I would graciously give away a pair of socks every week on the month of October to one person. Yeah, I'm awesome. And, uh, and so we say this, and we built this community around it. There are all these people online who were saying, I want socks, and I love socks, and passionately talking about the socks they love. And then we flipped it, and we exposed them to a need that was happening um, uh, right in our neighborhood. My friend Aaron uh, works with the homeless in Little Rock, Arkansas. He has a van. He drives around in this van, he fills it up with supplies that uh, homeless men and women would need. Basic human needs, he fills his van up and drives around until it's empty. Instead of standing there and waiting for people to come to him, he goes directly to them and it's a beautiful work. He's changing lives. And we wanted to help him. It would have been easy to just like slap up a few sad pictures of homeless men and women, play a Sarah McLaughlin song like in the arms of an angel or something like that, and like have people crying like, here, take my money. But uh, our theory is that sadness is not the best motivator. Um, so instead, we did something dumb, because that's what I'm good at. Um, we created a song, a rap song called How Can I Have Swag If I Ain't Got My Socks On. <laughs> And uh, here now is a clip of that song. We sold this uh, with the proceeds all going directly to my friend Aaron in Little Rock. Yeah, it doesn't get much better after that. Uh, yeah, it wasn't really worth all that trouble, was it? Um, 
Yeah, when we did this song, and I know it's ridiculous, but somehow it worked. What we found is that if we did something that creatively connected people to a need, then magic happened. Awesome happened. And as we were doing this and we set on this journey, we found that uh, people enjoy giving, and they know that there's darkness, and they know that homelessness isn't funny. What they don't know is that there's people overcoming it. And so we set out to share that, to amplify that. As we set out on this journey, we began to meet people all over the world who were creatively meeting needs in their neighborhoods. These were amazing people, and they were all asking the same question. What if things don't have to be the way that they are? These were people who were doing things who were like these two girls here, who are uh, high school students in Alabama who found a need in their neighborhood that there were um, boys and girls who only had uh, one meal a day, and it was the meal at their school. And on the weekends, they had no food. So these girls not only creatively connected to that need, they also collaborated with people all over their neighborhood. These two girls both went to different schools. They both asked men and women that, they, uh, that were in their community how they could help. They connected with the shelter. And they asked elderly women at their churches to cook food. And now on Saturdays, there's a program in which they provide meals to kids who wouldn't have it otherwise. Creativity, compassion, and collaboration. That changes everything. We found that cre collaboration was something we were really bad at. Like we didn't play well with others, so we set out to change that. We wanted to really do something differently, so we said we're not only gonna creatively meet needs, we're not gonna just do that, we're gonna collaborate with people. So our, we, um, we decided to put this to the test. These, uh, my little brother and sister, we found a need right in our backyard. My little brother and sister have osteogenesis imperfecta, otherwise known as brittle bone disease. They're normal, everyday kids, it's just their bones break. Um, Robbie is an active little boy who wants to be a football player, and yet his bones break. Lexi is a beautiful young girl who was told she'd never walk, and yet today she dances. And these two kids have both benefited greatly from an, an organization in our community that provides children with special needs the opportunity to play, to play on a, organized sports on a team. We found out that Michael and his team at Special Needs Athletics needed a new field. So we set out to change that and to help them. We did, but we decided we were going to get together a team of people that wasn't just us. We started with the normal band of morons, us. Um, <laughs> And then we invited one of our friends, Deanna, who is a truly compassionate person who loves music. She tours with bands. We then invited our friend Titus, who is as intelligent as that picture makes him look. And <laughs> Titus was working at a radio station at the time. Um, then we invited a painter named Nathan Durfee who had done work with the Ronald McDonald House. He was in Savannah, Georgia, and we said he knew things that we didn't. Let's bring him on board. Next thing we knew, we had 11 different artists from all over the country who had, who had offered to donate music to a project, including many who wrote original pieces. We even had my favorite band from when I was 13, They Might Be Giants, who were giving to this, and this was getting huge. So then we said, let's involve our community online. So we used the Love and Stereo community that we had built online and asked them to be a part of this project as well. We wanted 100% of the proceeds to go directly to the team and to the project, so we used Kickstarter, to raise the funds. In doing so, we involved over 300 people when it was all said and done in the creation of a project called One for the Team. This album proved to us that together we were louder. Together we could create something that was beautiful and that was different and that was loud. We found out that these, this was not just an album that was raising funds or raising awareness. It was involving people in a story that was much bigger than all of us, which is what we all want to be a part of. Today, as I share this with you, I want to share with you that we are all maybe sometimes feel like we're small and feel like there's not a lot that we can do. And you may find yourself in your room like I was when I was 15. I was scared to come out of there because it's a scary world, and the problems are huge. And a lot of times we're fooled into thinking that it's easier to do things on our own, that somehow collaboration is impossible. Collaboration is rarely easy, but things are always better when we work together. You are not alone in your efforts. There are nearly three billion people under the age of 20. 
That is a huge number. And when I look at this number, I see hope. And I see potential. Because imagine this number, a generation of people dedicated to uniting their voices for good. To saying, I'm not just gonna sit back and, and attempt to do things on my own. I'm going to collaborate and use the creativity of others to reach the needs in my community. Imagine an entire generation of people who've said, together, we're louder. An entire generation who've said, we're gonna do something different. We're gonna do something loud. A generation who said, we're not gonna stay in our rooms. We have an option. We can stay in our rooms, sit, and watch the world go by. Or we have a different option. We can step outside and collectively scream, shout, working together, saying, together we are louder. May you be loud.